All right, everyone. Welcome to the Pine Financial Webinar. My name is Justin Cooper, and I'm a full-time real estate investor and senior loan officer at Pine Financial Group. I started investing back in 2007. I lost money on that first flip, but I learned a lot, and have since gone on to have many more successful flips. I own a few rental properties. I've built new construction. I've tried my hand at wholesaling, direct mail, and even buying notes. Pine Financial Group is Colorado and Minnesota's premier hard money lender. We raise and lend private money to real estate investors and help them increase their cash on cash returns by reducing their cash out of pockets. In addition, we host these webinars, month monthly in-person networking events, and we also host the Real Estate Investor Success Summit. Now, before we get started, I want to give a huge thank you to everyone who made it on to tonight's event. We know that you've given up some of your valuable time, so Charles and I will do everything we can to bring the value that you're hoping for. Tonight it should be pretty easy, as we're talking to your castle real estate's Charles Roberts. Charles has been a landlord for over a decade and has done numerous fix and flips. He's currently president of Your Castle Real Estate, Colorado's leading investor-friendly agent brokerage, and teaches several classes a month to help investors and agents grow their business. I've given our listeners just a little overview, Charles, so take a few minutes, tell us about you personally. We want to get to know you, and then give us an overview of your business. Thanks, Coop. Um, so yeah, I started investing in real estate about 19 years ago. I bought a duplex in 1998 and honestly didn't have a great plan for it. I just had a little extra money and thought, let's give it a shot. Believe it or not, that's what got me started. And it worked out pretty well, so I bought another duplex and um, got more involved and started to do a uh, fix and flip. And in the 2001s, 2002, 2003, I did just about a couple of dozen fix and flips and honestly I, I don't think I was very good at it to be perfectly honest. Um, I found that I made money on some, I lost money on some, I ended up acquiring a bunch more. I had 29 units after a few years that, uh, that I was beginning to cash flow on them. Um, I got licensed in 2004 just to be a better investor and what I found was I actually brought a lot of value to folks were trying to invest because I had been an investor for seven years before that and much to my surprise um, I actually liked being an agent and that's when we built up your castle we created your castle real estate and began to build that up over the years uh, to a 520 person firm now and uh, what I do now is I run your castle so I have a staff and we have a, a large brokerage the seventh largest brokerage here in Metro Denver and I also work with clients and uh, to kind of do the stuff that I love to do is uh, help people buy and, and invest in real estate and on top of that I bought three additional properties uh, to add to my portfolio just the last few months. So busy guy, all real estate all the time and just the luckiest guy in the world. Love it. I appreciate that. Uh, so let's dive a little bit deep, deeper into your business uh, today. So how are you making money in today's market? <clears throat> in what way? I, I sort of do multiple things. So my, my top yeah, three will be I'm an investor all of them, yeah. and I'm a real estate agent and um, you know your castle real estate, I, I run that. So I think from the investor side, um, I'm a buy and hold guy. Uh, I am just, what I have found um, is that it is simply easier and less risk to make money by buying and holding properties. And I'm sure you have a bunch of people who disagree and have actually made great money flipping and that's great and I respect that. Um, but just with my vantage point and with my history and being able to see a lot of people in this business both make money and fail, just try to advocate to people that being a landlord isn't as bad as you think and there's enormous wealth to be gained um, by being a landlord. So that's that's kind of my shtick. That's what I do. And it's what I do personally. I buy property and I'm, I'm not selling any now. I'm very happy with my portfolio and uh, I, I tend to work with people who think the same. Okay. So uh, tell us about being an investor right now. How many properties do you have right now and what does that look like? Um, I have 13 properties right now. Um, I gone up to 29 at one point and a number of them I owned with a business partner and that's when your castle was really starting to take off and what I found was that I was just getting overwhelmed so my business partner who's still one of my best buddies he wanted to own more properties I wanted to own fewer so we just kind of worked it out he took a bunch of the properties over I scaled down uh, my management of my properties and spent more time running your castle and building it and also being a real estate agent and like I said I just added three more to my portfolio uh, just found properties that made absolute sense in a in a development out uh, by the airport here in Denver and I bought three um, since January I bought three um, I've closed five additional deals for clients and I'm closing my sixth one next week so that'll be a total of nine just since January these made sense and we jumped on 
Gotcha. So three for you personally, and then the others are you being an agent. Because you've mentioned three different ways you're making money. So we talked on as a, being an investor. What about an agent? Are you just working with investors? Or are you working with um, retail buyers? That's a great question. So um, to date, I've, I've closed 19 deals in 2016. I'll have 24 deals by the end of June 2016. So it keeps me pretty busy. About 70% of those deals are investor deals. I I, um, I went on a contract with a deal last night, and I just put an offer in about eight minutes ago on another deal. Um, and the rest are owner rocks, but maybe not surprisingly, a lot of them are my investors who made so much money they're buying personal homes. Um, you know, I'm closing a deal with Michael uh, at the end of the month, and he's been a successful investor, and he's buying a personal home. So it tends to revolve around that. But honestly, I, you know, a lot of people in my business don't like working with uh, owner rocks or, you know, God forbid, first-time home buyers. I love first-time home buyers. It's fun. It's easy. It's it's great. It just brings so much value. So I just love being in the real estate game. <laughs> That's great. That's great. And then, so what about uh, running your castle? What does that look like for you? Oh, <laughs> well, that's fun. Um, you know, I have a staff of about 25 people, and I have, a, they're just a really great staff that we built from the ground up. I'm just very, very proud of them. Uh, we have a, a managing broker side where we have seven managing brokers that help our agents through all of their difficulties in building a business in real estate. And then we have the administration side, and we've just got incredibly wonderful people, and I'm blessed to be a part of it. Um, honestly, it's a lot of fun, believe it or not. So it sounds like you're, you're wearing three pretty substantial hats, right? The investor where you're owning uh, three rental properties, uh, you're closing, what, 30 transactions in the first six months as an agent, and then you know, the staff of uh, 25 um, folks at your castle as well as the 500-something agents. Uh, so yeah. what does a normal day look like for you? If you were to divide them up uh, between the three, or is it 30, 30, 30 percent, or is, it, uh, is one way heavier? Yeah. So, okay, so I own 13 properties, and what I can tell you as a property, I actually manage my own property, which a lot of people think is crazy, but I don't think so. And I will tell you, um, here's the amount of time I put into it. And I, I talk to lots of people, I teach lots of classes, and I get feedback from other really successful landlords. I spend about a half an hour per unit per month all in managing my properties. And that's one of the things that people who have never done this don't believe. <laughs> you know, there is the myth of the midnight phone call. I have over 2,500 tenant months. One tenant, one month, one tenant month. I've been doing this for a while. I've never had a midnight phone call. That said, I can tell you some crazy stories, and, and Coop, you've heard a lot of them. We teach together. We have a lot of fun talking about this stuff. That's true. Uh, and there so, are so do you there get are times phone calls because you just turn off your ringer at night, or. No. <laughs> Don't ask me embarrassing questions, but look, the, the truth is I spend about a half an hour per month. It is not difficult to manage, but what you have to understand if you want to get in this game is that you are going to have a bad day, and you might even have a bad week, and you need to be able to deal with it, and I can tell you about some crazy stories. And You've heard me say this before. I honestly think 80% of people should not be landlords. They just don't want to do it. They don't have what it takes, whatever it is, and that is fine. I truly believe that. For the other 20%, it's not as bad as you think, and you make unbelievable money by being a long-term landlord. Everybody does it who does it for 10 or 20 years, without exception. Yeah, yeah. well, let's talk about that half an hour a month per unit, uh, half an hour per unit per month. Um, times are pretty good right now. Uh, rents are increasing. We seem to have a big supply of renters uh, knocking down our door to try and get into our units. But what was it like when uh, and vacancies are at an all-time low? What was it like? for you when vacancies were at those all-time highs? Was it still a half hour a unit uh, a month, or was it something very different back then? No, it was different, and that's a great question. So in 2003, we had 13.4% vacancy rate. Right now, it's 1.6 in one to four units. It was a big, big difference. So here's what the difference was. A little bit was about the rents. What I saw my rents do is go down about 10 to 15%. They did go down, but they didn't plummet. They went down, and I have a lot of units in low-end areas, not, you know, nice. I mean, duplexes, southwest Denver, I mean, areas that I love and that I'm great with, but are not the high-rent districts, and that's where I was renting my places. And my rents went down a little bit, 10 or 15. What was the difference was the quality of the tenant, without mm -hmm. question. Tenants, yeah. they know this market better than we do. We think we're smart. We're not. They are. They live this. They know exactly 
what the market is like. You can tell from literally the tone and the tenor of the phone call. The difference today is they're polite. They want to help you. Back then, it's, what do you mean you don't have a three-car garage? Are you kidding? What do you mean you don't have air conditioning? I don't have air conditioning in my house, but my tenants are complaining that they don't have air conditioning. That's the difference. And someday, we're going to go back, and it's not going to be for a while. It really isn't. At this low vacancy with not enough building, we have a legitimate housing crisis for low-end folks. But someday, we'll go back to that. I think it's going to be years and years away, but someday we'll be there, and I'll go through it again. What I can tell folks who haven't been there before is that if you work hard, you can always rent your places. If you're lazy, you're going to lose your places. Don't get into yeah. real estate if you're lazy. That's a bad combination. Absolutely. Well. Let's back up for a second here. Um, tell us about how you got started and, and back up a little further, not just uh, about that first deal, but what got you into it? Why did you buy that first duplex? And, and walk us through what that deal actually looked like. You know, I, I just have, like, a, it's not an exciting story. I remember at the age of 29 arguing with someone about how stupid it would be to buy a house to live in. I remember that conversation. I was getting my master's at the engineering school at CU in telecom. I remember that conversation. A year later, I got married, and six weeks after that, I bought a house, right? Go for it. And then I'm just, I had to make money. And uh, someone told me to talk to Pat Armbrust, who I've never heard of before, who the an icon in this business, and he was able to take me on. And I bought my first duplex, but it wasn't like, um, I knew a lot. I read Bill Bronchick's book, the one where he's holding all the cash and you know making the money. I read that book. That's what I knew about real estate. What I got in. It's a it's a it's a boring story. But I bought. Um, I intended to hold. I put it on a 15 year loan, which was the smartest thing I've ever done. And I did a lot of smart things when I knew nothing. It's when I thought I started to know something that I ended up screwing things up. And I bought so, another one. So what made you deep into it? What made you put it on a 15 year note? Why did you choose a 15 instead of a 30? I want to pay it off, I guess. I don't I don't know that I have um, sorry, the cleaning folks are here. Sorry, I'm up on a webinar. Um, I just thought handing it off would make sense. So I did know that much at the age of thirty one that it probably would make sense. And it's it truly is the best thing I've ever done. And and you and I teach lots of classes on building wealth and real estate and we show people the difference between the fifteen year and the thirty year and how how quickly you can buy properties, even in today's market, and pay them off if you're if you're meticulous and judicious and slow and methodical I and mean, you can still do it today but that's yeah. it I just figured I wanted to pay it off and um, it's a life-changing event when you do that so tell me a little bit more about it um, so it's a 15-year loan what kind of interest rate was it how much did you put down what, okay. what did it look like for you I'm looking up at the sky right 15 I, I'm, I'm guessing I have to look but it was probably a six and a half percent interest rate I mean this was okay. back in 1998 when I bought my first duplex on 13th and Winona in Metro Denver um, and I uh, put uh, 20 or 25% down. Those were the days where you couldn't get away with the 5 or 10%. That was before really the loose lending standards uh, began. So I'm guessing, I think it was 20%. It was either 20 or 25. I put the money okay. down, you know, amortized it, and we were good. And so where did that money come from? Had you just been saving? I mean, you're saying you had gotten a master's degree. Were you, did you have a good job that was paying you well? Did you have some family yeah. that helped you out? No, I had no family. So, I, you know, it's funny you should ask this. I'm not sure if we've talked about this before. All right, I'm going to answer that question. So I get out of college, and all my friends, I went to, you know, fancy school and everything, and all my friends get really nice jobs, and what do they do? They buy Acuras and nice cars. And I buy a $2,200 Subaru DL from 1984. And I actually calculated one time. The seven years between the time I was 24 and the time I was 31, I put together the difference in what my friends paid for their cars and what I paid, and it was about $30,000 was the difference, and guess what? That was the down payment of my first duplex, which is paid off, which helped me buy my second duplex and my third, and all my properties are paid off. If you're 24, buy an old Subaru. Okay, spend two thousand dollars on it. Don't be fancy schmancy. Put that money away and then buy real estate because that is literally why I had the money because I didn't buy a nice car. And so, do you still have that duplex? Yeah, that's a thirteen fifteen Winona Court. Do you still have the car? No. Um, so I until two years ago, and you know this, um, I was driving my wife's uh, nineteen ninety one Honda Civic that. She 
out of college. I hit 245,000 miles, and for the last seven years that I drove it, it didn't actually have air conditioning, and it was getting, you know. And my kids finally, you know, they kind of said, Dad, enough, you know, enough. So I donated it to uh, Colorado Public Radio, felt really good about that, and we got a new Honda Civic that uh, was driving into my late years, I promise you. That's great. Well, I mean, that's that's the millionaire next door type of stuff right there, right? I mean, just well, because you're doing well and you're making money doesn't mean you have to go spend it on everything, and that's how more people like yourself. I mean, when you first had uh, saved your money for that duplex, you know, you, you live not necessarily frugally, but you're not living lavishly, and that money suddenly starts compounding, and you're able to do a lot more things. And on my notes, um, you had asked what book I might recommend in real estate, and there really oh, isn't one in real estate. Millionaire Next Door, that's my favorite book. We're jumping ahead here. That's all right. That's all right. <laughs> um, so anyway, that's what it was. Not not a great story. Yeah. Just put money away. Put money down. Don't don't think you're so smart. Just buy, hold for the long term. You will make unbelievable amounts of money. Absolutely. And so it was a duplex. So what was that like? Uh, you guys, you and your new wife lived in half of it, uh, and I no, assume you had it. No, 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 no. This you was lived a total. On one side and your wife lived on the other side. Yeah, we we got uh, we got married in '97. Bought a house in Arvada that I still live in. Just a Nice house, okay. great place to raise a family. And uh, okay. a year later, we bought the duplex. That was a rental property. Gotcha, gotcha. So you rented both sides from the right. get-go. Got it. Okay. So let's jump ahead a bit now. Um, share with us the, your best deal. And maybe it was that one-on-one, -on -one, Nona. But walk us through the, your best deal uh, from really beginning to end. My best deal, uh, you know, the three that I just bought, honestly, were phenomenal deals. Um, these were in a complex called First Creek uh, out by the airport, and uh, what happened is, is that these were just kind of normal townhouses. Uh, they were built between 2006 and 2010, and what happened is they had a lawsuit going on with KB Homes, and we just stumbled upon these properties really in the fall of 2015, and um, your colleague Travis Spear bought two and actually had asked me about them, saying, hey, Charles, what do you think of these, before I even thought about buying one myself. Uh, and they were just great deals. So uh, the first one I bought, I closed on January 24th of 2016. I paid $170,500 for it. Uh, one of my colleagues, Jackie White, who I helped when she got her license two years ago, she let me know about it. She actually found this property by prospecting. She uh, sent mailers out. And she sold Travis his properties as well. So I wasn't even the agent on this deal. And I said, great, you, you keep the commission, no problem. And I bought that one. And then they were so good, I ended up buying a few more. And she and I have this running bet right now that's going to be settled in December at Morton's on who gets to close more deals in 2016. She's beating me right now 10 to 9 in First Creek. But we love this development. Uh, the problem is, for your listeners, is that the properties, the three properties I bought for 170 are all at about 225 right now. They settled the lawsuit. And they just, uh, five, six days ago, they transferred $10.4 million into the HOA. And um, we're very happy about that. Gotcha. So, so um, a lot of people get nervous around condos and townhomes because there are HOAs. Uh, and you actually worked it to where it's in your favor, but a lot of people can be nervous because there are there could be these types of issues with your HOA. So one, how what kind of diligence did you do on the HOA? How did you hear about this issue that it was such a good deal? Uh, and then what sh maybe should other people be looking out for if they're working or looking to work on uh, properties with HOAs? So my due diligence was two phone calls to Travis Spear and to Joe Massey, our colleague who's a lender, both of whom had bought properties a couple of months before me, and I respect utterly. And I said, guys, what do you think? And they said, we're good. And I said, great, that's it. That's all I need to know. <laughs> that, I am not joking. That was my due diligence. And you know, you're asking, and I'm telling you. Uh, you know, I'm no, I'm no attorney. I'm no HOA expert. But if these guys were good with it, I was good with it. And that's what I did. I completely understand people who say um, they may be nervous about an HOA. I understand that. But you should be nervous about everything in real estate. You should do your due diligence. And there's nothing like you're going to make more money with a single family or a duplex or a condo or a townhouse. It's not that simple. But the, you can get help understanding HOAs and understand sometimes bad things happen. And sometimes they happen in a 20 unit. Bad things do happen in real estate, which is why most people shouldn't invest in real estate because you've got to deal with them. But by and large, they don't happen. And as a matter of fact, um, I don't know if you know about this, but Brent Goyer, who's uh, one of our agents at Castle, who knows everything about HOAs, turned me on to an insurance policy that you can actually get insurance. So in case that there's a special assessment, there's special assessment insurance. 
So I actually haven't done that yet, but Brent told me about it, and he owns a bunch of condos and has helped and has taught me a lot about them as well. That's just one of the things that if you dig into the due diligence, you might want to look into at a, at a very reasonable price. You can actually have what they call special assessment insurance. If anybody wants to know about that, just ping me and I'll put you in touch. That's that's great. Thank you for, for opening yourself up for that. Um, and it, in a way, it sounds like almost like you had cheated on the diligence. Uh, not necessarily cheated, but uh, you know, jumped ahead in line. But in a way, uh, what you're also saying, though, is having a strong, solid network can really <laughs> reap benefits. Even though, in a way, these guys are competitors because they're uh, also buying properties in the same time frame, in the same neighborhood. Uh, at the same time, just having that uh, the network allowed you to reach out. You knew people who were doing this stuff. They willingly shared information because really there's enough properties for all of us. Um, and it allowed you to save a lot of time, pull the trigger a little faster, and, and pick up three properties. Literally. I mean, real estate is a team sport. You are my network. I hope to be your network. I mean, we want to work with good people, and that's one of the things that we might end up talking about is how do you break into that network. But this is a perfect example of it kind of wasn't what I knew, it was who I knew. Jackie brought this deal to me, and I called two of my best buddies who owned here, who, you know, in the past maybe I did a few favors for, or maybe they did a few favors for me. Yeah, that is the absolute truth. But look, we all started someplace. You started somewhere, I started somewhere, we all started somewhere. And if you do a great job and you help people and, and truly try to do better for people, you make one phone call and suddenly you can jump ahead of the line, just like you said, because of your network. It's incredibly important. Yeah, absolutely, uh, and it's uh, maybe a fun transition right now since we're talking about the good things and having a strong, solid network to jump ahead and have you tell us now about a failure that you may have had or gone through, maybe your worst deal or maybe something else that you might want to chalk up as a failure. Tell us about that. What what have been some of the hardships you've had to overcome as an investor? How much time you have, you know? I could go all night here, right? <laughs> so if you, if you don't have failures as an investor, you're a liar. I, I don't know any other way to put it. Like, everybody does. And maybe I'll come back to you and ask you about some of your failures. <laughs> Look, yeah, absolutely. And I'm very proud and happy to tell people about it. Um, I think a lot of my worst deals were very early on. After I bought my first duplexes, um, for buy and hold, I started to fix and flip. And like I said at the beginning, I don't think I was very good at it. One of the brilliant ideas I had was to take a single family home that had a basement and convert it into a legal duplex. Wow, that was a bad idea. Turns really? out, um, well, yeah, I mean, I, I wasn't a construction person okay. and I knew nothing about Denver city codes and okay. the Denver city code people killed me and they killed me and I was so stupid I did it twice, not just once. It made sense on paper. You take a single family, you finish the basement, you make it legal, and you rent it and you increase the value. It just didn't work out that way. And it was a perfect example of someone getting ahead of themselves and not really knowing what they're doing and thinking they're smarter than everybody else. And what I learned is I am not smarter than everybody else. So, so what happened there? Um, I mean, if you legally split it, you follow the proper channels to turn a single family into a duplex. Uh, I assume they wanted everything done to code all the improvements and finishing of the basement, so that should have been done, right? Uh, unless, did you have the contractor come in and pull permits and all that? So then what, yeah, what happened? Yeah, it cost me there? five times more than I thought it would. So where and did I you did get it. caught? What happened? I didn't get caught. I just spent way too much money. So I did everything right, but even the inspectors would show up and say, huh, I've never quite seen this before. Yeah, why don't you just take everything out and let's start over again? I mean, that was the sort of thing that I was going through. and. I did it, and I did successfully, and I rented them, and I got the certificate of occupancies. I did it all, but it, it, it almost broke me. It was very, very expensive to actually do it correctly, and that was a, a lesson well learned. So what would you have done differently? Would you have brought in the city sooner into the process? Would you have made sure your contractors uh, had pulled permits or done more no, background they, check they, on your they did contractors? Pull permits. I wasn't trying to do anything outside of the city. Uh, it's really simple. I wouldn't have done it. It's just that simple. I mean, I didn't know, and there was nobody telling me not to do it, and I didn't have, I didn't have that, you know, that 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 Justin Cooper, that person to say, do you really want to do that? Maybe this isn't that smart. Maybe you don't know what you're doing. That was my problem, is I didn't have that. Um, and I, I, I would suggest people be very careful, thinking you can do something that you may not be able to do. But that's interesting. I, I, of course, appreciate you dropping my name and people calling me for uh, for help and stuff. But um, last 
question, talking about your best deals, it was your network that helped you get into these great deals. And on your worst deal that we just talked about, you didn't have a network or you didn't rely on any of your network to ask those questions and thus you had a bad deal. So it's really interesting that you point that out. Yeah, and I didn't actually mean to say that, but you're exactly right. That's Look at it. That's exactly what I said. Uh, I, if I had had the network, if I had people who were ahead of me, who knew what they were talking about to be able to guide me a little bit, I think they may have guided me into not taking those that, that set of risks that I took. Yeah. So I think we had, uh, you may have mentioned this a little earlier, but at some point in your journey, a light bulb came on and you had an aha moment. Something clicked, you said, this is an awesome idea. What was that aha moment? What kind of led up to it and, and where did you go after it? You know, surprisingly, um, it was becoming a real estate agent. So when I got my license on October 30th of 2004, I swore that I would just be a better investor. I mean, honestly, the idea of being a real estate agent, come on, I went to college, right? Like, you know, I had my master's, like a real estate agent, oh my God. And then I closed my first deal six days later. Okay? And I closed 34 deals my first year. And it took me a long time to get over myself and realize, wow, this is actually a really honorable profession. You can do a great job, you can make great money and actually help people and not necessarily risk your own money. That was the aha for me in my career. That was the best thing that I ever did, was taking the seven years of knowledge, kind of beating my head against many, many plaster walls as an investor, doing some good and some not so good, and taking that wealth of information and beginning to be a real estate agent, which has helped me be a better investor, which has helped me be a better agent. But surprisingly, that actually was, I think, the aha for me, and that was just an accident. I, I just you know, got licensed and said, yeah, you know, maybe I'll just keep my own commissions or something. and. Um, it worked out really well for me. Great. So follow that aha moment maybe down the road a little bit. Have you had an I made it moment yet? I suppose paying off all my properties. I mean, yeah, I mean, that, I don't know, there's no polite way to say it. Once you pay off all your properties, you go, all right, I can, I can do whatever I want. And you know what? This is what I want to do. I want to talk to yeah. you over the internet. This is what I want to do. Is that? I, I would thought you were going to go with, uh, you know, sit on a boat for three months at a time. Well, I am going to Seattle and I chartered a 28-foot boat that I'm going to sail in Puget Sound with my family next week. So you brought it up, not me, but um, <laughs> yeah, that is what I'm going to do a lot more with my life. But, you know, this is my job. This is my love. I love to do it. And the, the ability to pay off my final property, write a check and say, okay, I'm just done. I got them all paid off. It's a great thing. And let me tell you, Honestly, anybody who buys a property and isn't stupid and deals with some bad days can do it. You, just, you have to have the money. You have to put it together. You do not have to be fancy. And, you know, you, you've heard me say this. I'm not a big creative financing guy. I understand it. I've seen it. I've seen it work. I've seen it fail. But to be that smart, you buy and hold property. Property goes up over the long term. You make tons of money. Yeah. I mean, it really could just be that simple. You know, and you're I, an investor. You're a long-term investor. Get crazy, but it could just also be as easy as you save up for a down payment, you buy a house, you pay it off, and then you do it again. I mean, if you had to guess between you and Travis and Kevin in your office, what do you own, like 50 units, 60? I mean, you guys are uh, Probably close investors. to 70. Yeah. I mean, yeah. good for you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's pretty fun. We get a lot of those phone calls, and uh, it, it's interesting overhearing each other in the office when we get calls from tenants for different reasons. Right now it's early in the month, right? So we're getting a lot of the, the rent calls or the lack of rent calls or we're making the rent calls. So uh, just kind of comparing notes, maybe best practices. Uh, it's certainly interesting and it, and it makes it fun for us. You know, uh, when you're working, not just having a network of investors, but actually sharing an office with other investors, it, it can be a lot of fun uh, sharing different ideas, sharing deals um, and partnerships can come from it very easily. It's been a and lot of fun. Let's not forget, it's not all you know, unicorns and candy corn. I mean, you're going to have your bad times. You are going to if you do this for a long time. No way around it. No, you're not smart enough to figure out that every tenant's going to be good. No, that website isn't going to do it for you. No, that property manager isn't going to do it for you. There is no way around it. You're going to have some horror stories, but you're going to be paid incredibly well to have a few horror stories over the years. That is exactly what... We who've done this for a while realize that you're not smart enough to, 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 to miss every pothole. You're going to hit some potholes and you're going to have some bad days, but you're paid really well to do it. 
Yeah, exactly. And I feel like you're speaking directly to me on that because I've definitely hit some potholes. Uh, I think I've told you about some of the, the stories I have already, but exactly. So uh, let's jump back into you and, and your current business. What's one thing that's really exciting you about your business today? Well, this market is so interesting, uh, but you know it's always interesting, and we love talking about the market, and I love working with clients and and trying to explain to the best of my ability, you know, what to do in this market and how to play it. So I, I just find that really exciting. Um, you know, we have a very hot market right now, but here's something that I don't know if I've ever mentioned to you. I did an analysis recently, and I looked at a bunch of the properties that my clients bought in 2009, 2010, during the downturn, when things were really kind of bad. Yeah. And um, I, I, I looked at a bunch of the properties, the typical properties that my clients bought in 2015, and I did an analysis, analysis on uh, Joe Massey's great spreadsheet. And you know what was amazing? The returns and the cap rates were almost the same. And really? this is startling. But here's the deal. We were buying stuff on 13th and Akron Street, or North Aurora. We'd pay $80,000 for a little two-bedroom, one-bath that had a, you know, a, a finished garage. So it was a three-bedroom, one-bath, 854 square feet. We'd buy it for $80,000. We'd put $12,000 into it, and we'd rent it for eight fifty. dollars And the cap rate might have been about eight. And today, uh, and I'm not talking about these first few properties. I'm talking the typical property that we buy. We'll right. have about a 7374 cap rate. The returns are almost the same. It's so interesting. And a cap rate doesn't take into account the interest rate, the market interest rate. It's actually lower now than it was then. So what people say is, well, it's too late in the cycle. The prices are too high. What you forget, of course, is that the rents have gone up almost the exact same as the price of homes. So I can't tell the future. I can't say if it's not too late or it is too late. I can just say I bought three more properties because I'm very bullish that these will be very solid investments. And believe it or not, we're getting about the same returns we got at the depth of the market. Yeah. And I appreciate you going into some detail on the property, uh, getting into some specifics because we have a national audience on the call. We've got a lot of folks from the East Coast. We got folks from Minnesota, and they don't know Akron Street. You know, they don't know where it is. But when you start going into some more of those numbers, I think it makes sense, and and it's easily transferable into okay, well, we have 800 square foot homes for this type of price point that need those types of repairs. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think they can draw those correlations. Uh, and we're seeing it across, uh, you know, in all the different markets and all the different investors we talk to. We're hearing very similar things about how hot the market is. Um, in fact, it, probably everybody on the call is in a market that's hitting some of those tops, best of, you know, all the different lists that are coming out every single week about which market is the hottest and which market is the best and why. Um, so I, I think we're seeing everybody on the call is seeing something similar to that. So they may not know exactly where, you know, the the cross streets that you're talking about are, but they're seeing similar things in their markets. And one of the things that I, I get questioned a lot is about the market, is it too late to buy, that sort of thing. And I, I feel very, very strongly that you can't predict the market, and neither can I, that nobody really can predict the market. So I think the last thing anyone should do is say, uh, I'm going to buy here because the market's going to go up, or I'm not going to buy there because the market's going to go down. Get over it. That is a very, very bad way to invest in real estate. And, and Justin, you're laughing, and you know people who have done this, and you know people who have made business, colleagues of ours doing this sort of thing and selling that information. I think that's a disaster. I really do. I think that you should, if you want to get into real estate long term, you should say, I want to buy a property every nine months or every two years, and I want to pay it off, and I want to build wealth, and I am not so smart to be able to know which market or which neighborhood is going to go up higher than the others. I really think it's way more difficult to do that, and I can tell you, I know a lot about our local market, and I don't think I can figure that out. That's not why I bought the properties I bought. So my advice to people is um, control what you can control, and there's a whole lot you can control yourself, your lending what you're doing, managing the risks that you're willing to take and not willing to take, I think that's what people should concentrate on. And don't read a truly article or go to a weekend seminar that says, you know, all these flashpoints and this is what's going to happen to the market. That's BS. That's a really, really bad way to invest in real estate. Yeah. Well, uh, let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, I keep hearing a lot about uh, are we in a bubble? Is this a bubble? Um, what do you see happening here in the in the near future? Are, do you think we're in a bubble, at least in Denver? Um, and if, again, I think Denver transfers over to a lot of these other markets because everybody's been recovering since the downturn. But what do you what are your thoughts on that? 
it, it starts with nobody can accurately predict the future. Let me start with that. But to answer your question, and we analyze this very closely, honestly, no, I, I don't. If I had to guess, and I am guessing because I just bought some properties and my clients are too, uh, the Denver market I don't think is in a bubble if you're defining a bubble as something that's going to crash disastrously. Um, it, the big number for us is the inventory. Uh, at the bottom of our market, we have 31,000 properties in the market. It's all about when supply. You, and when you say the bottom of the market, you're talking about in the middle of the crash, right? Yeah, at the yeah. height of the crash, so to say. Yeah, 2009, there were 31,000 properties on the market. Right now, there's about 5,000. And Denver has increased a lot in population. Supply and demand. You have more people looking for property, and there are fewer properties on the market. What happens? The market goes up. So that isn't going to change for a while. We look very closely at the number of permits, the building that's going up, and we really think that if you're a renter, you're in a crisis situation right now because rents continue to go up. I don't see that changing anytime soon. I really don't. That said, I would not suggest that anybody buy real estate if you need to sell it in three or four years. Who knows what's going to happen? I don't know. I think I know, and I'm going to make a good guess at it. What I can tell you is that if you buy and you hold forever, you're going to be a millionaire. There's just no way around it. If you buy and do a, a you know, a, a, a no interest loan and you know no money down and you have to sell in three years and you're using OPM and all that kind of stuff I just think that's you know probably a disaster and I think trying to predict the market surprisingly is difficult to do as opposed to being businesslike and methodical and buying and holding and managing your risks where you have an excellent chance of building an enormous amount of wealth without too much risk yeah, so to put it in perspective here for uh, other markets, uh, at the height of it, we had 31,000 properties. Right now, we have 5,000. What for Denver would be a balanced market, uh, and how would you define a balanced market to then you know, put in, in, in better perspective for people in other markets? Yeah, a balanced market would be about 18 to 20,000, an inventory of 18 to 20,000 properties on the market, which also equates to a six months of inventory, which is also the same thing as 90 days on market bunch of different numbers, but if you hear 90 days on market and six months of inventory, that's the same thing. And a market of about three million people, which the front range is of Metro Denver, that equates to about 18 to 20,000. And we're at four or 5,000 right now, and we just don't see it changing anytime soon. The good news is that when we get to 10,000 and 12,000 and 14,000, we're going to start talking about it, and we're going to start letting people know. Maybe there'll be good deals coming down the pipe, maybe not. We'll have to see, but it's not going to happen overnight. If you look at a seven-year chart, when we had 31,000, it's not like it went from 31,000 to 4,000. It took years to get there, and you can follow the market and see what's going to happen over time. Just don't speculate unless you have a bunch of extra money, you're willing to gamble it, and if you are, that's great, and gamble it. But understand that's gambling, not investing. Yeah, that's fair. What about affordability? People, uh, I hear a lot of chatter about uh, affordability, and it's not being, it's not sustainable. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Have you guys run any numbers on that? Yeah, we have, and it's actually a very complicated discussion and chart. But let me try to simplify it. What we looked at is the affordability by looking at the PITI, the Principal Interest Taxes and Insurance, over the last 30 years. What a payment is, which is based upon, of course, you know, housing prices, but also uh, the current interest rates. And what we found is, believe it or not, that right now houses are a little more affordable than they have been historically over 35 years. And most of that, of course, is the low interest rates. Clearly, it's the low interest rate. And on top of that, they're much less affordable than they were three years ago. No question about it. The prices have made it less affordable. But if you look at a 35-year chart, the reason Everyone was wrong four years ago when they said people can't afford it. Prices can't continue to go up. They have gone up. People can afford it. We have more demand than we've ever had. It's because of the affordability. Because with the low interest rates, housing is still relatively affordable. That's, that's the bottom line, and that explains why we still have more demand than supply. Way more. Yeah. Yeah, very good. So uh, tell me, both personally and uh, business, what do you see coming for you in the future? You know, um, I, I'm hoping to just continue to build your castle into a really great real estate brokerage and simply get better at what I do. I don't have any um, major plans. We don't want to go out of state. We don't want to develop anything. I don't want to 
own thousands of units, I'm, I'm very happy doing what I'm doing and continuing to get better. So in the multiple things that I do, running your castle, having a great brokerage, helping my agents, that is the goal of my life, being a real estate agent, helping people buy and sell property and, and analyze it and, and uh, you know, help them do the right thing and manage my properties and maybe buy a few more as I go along. But uh, nothing, nothing enormous, just I love real estate. I do this 15 hours a day. And, do it because I absolutely love to do it. That's what I will hope to continue doing and um, sailing more. <laughs> I want to. I'll be sailing more. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, well, my, while you are uh, in the office, uh, you're giving back a lot. You mentioned several times you want to help other people grow and, and be successful. I think that's huge. If you're able to, to give and, and help other people uh, and be open to receiving, then you absolutely will and things will come to you if you're out there helping others. I mean, and you're right, and it's it's not just this like you know a little <laughs> little fairy tale story. It's really true. Jackie White's a perfect example. She got into the business about two years ago. She was my mentee. I helped her on her first few deals. This, that, the other thing. Two years later, stumble on a deal, and she says, "Okay, you know, send us an offer," and I close it. And um, we're both going to do very well, you know, based on that relationship. The relationship is absolutely critical. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, but before we start winding down a little bit, let's talk a little bit about that uh, about the networking about relationships how did you did you do anything spectacular that helped grow these things or foster these things how did you get the network that you have now well no nothing spectacular um, honestly just one at a time so you and I have talked about this in classes about how new investors and new agents can begin to build the network and here's here's the deal and, and, and this is going to sound familiar because you have said it and so have I when you're new it turns out that people who are very successful in this business they don't really want to work with you they want to work with people who are really successful in the business so what do you do you know what you prove to them that you will be helpful and you'll be good and you'll be respectful and and you'll help them someday I mean that that's all I can say that maybe if I did anything right it was to just try to be a good person and do the right thing as much as I could by people and, I, and I'll tell you get, getting my license I you know I thought real estate agents were a bunch of bad people they're not they really overall are a bunch of really good people and if you do good by them by and large they're gonna do good by you so it's it sounds made up but it's I had I have no tricks I got nothing I just every single Single day, I try to do well and try to help people like you, so that someday you help me with something when I need something. Yeah, it, exactly. And that's what it comes down to. And and you mentioned uh, more successful people don't want to work with the the newbies, if you will. Um, I think that's probably more accurate because the more successful people already have the money, they already have the experience, and they probably already have the deal flow. So what could that new person bring to the table? What could they bring to a partnership? Uh, might be lacking a little bit, or at least not what they need but I think what I found is everybody in the real estate real estate investing uh, industry community uh, is very giving of their time and of their uh, experiences uh, they're not gonna sit down and have maybe a four-hour lunch with you or spend a half day driving around looking at properties but if you catch them at a networking event or at a class and you have a couple good questions you can absolutely ask them and they're gonna be an open book just like you have been on this webinar um, just sharing your experiences in hopes that uh, somebody else doesn't have those same uh, hopefully mistakes that, that you've uh, stumbled through. Um, and I've seen that happen. I've seen somebody come up to you at a at a Pine Financial monthly event who you don't know and they're brand new and if they're nice and respectful and say, hey Justin, you know, can I can I have a couple minutes of your time? You're gonna say yes. And and that's it really comes down to just human beings, being a good person. The last thing you want to do is take some really bad advice on how don't call Justin and say, hi, I'm building my real estate team. I would like to interview you, okay? That's a really bad combination. Um, it, that's good. Okay? I, I welcome those phone calls. <laughs> I welcome those phone you know, calls. Just be, a, just be a nice person, be a giving person, and try to help out as much as you can. And I think we're in a market and an environment where we really do get to work with a lot of great people. That's one of the positive things that I want people to know, at least about our market. That was a surprise to me, and it's been a pleasure, and I love working with people in our market. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think everybody uh, that I've met, remembers what it was like when they were getting started as an investor so they know what you're going through if you're a new investor they know the hiccups they know uh, the, the difficulties you're having uh, they know that you don't know the right questions to even be asking you know and they may help you out even just with that short little five minute conversation so don't be afraid to ask just be sure you respect their time you know, I think Perfect. that's what it comes that's down to. Way of saying it. I, I love I love talking to people and I love helping out and 
it's the last person you'd ever think who a year later can help you with something. You go, ah, oh, all right, there was a good business reason for doing this, but it's not why we did it. We did it because we love to talk about real estate. Absolutely. I mean, when I got started, I was sitting in classes that you, Charles, were teaching uh, with your castle, and I was just a fly on the wall trying to soak up as much as I possibly could. I probably shook your hand a handful of times, and you probably had no idea who I was, probably thinking, who's this uh, newbie over here trying to get going? But down the road, right, we, we've done business together, we host classes together, events, and here we are on this uh, webinar track together. And so I you, thank, you, really thank you for having it, yeah. Yeah, absolutely, of course. Thank you for all the help and support as well to help me get to this level. Um, but you, you just never know. You know, If you treat me with respect, I'm going to treat you with respect, and hopefully you know, one way or another we'll all be able to do a deal together and, and have fun and make money. And people do deals with people they know, and that's the truth. Exactly, exactly. Well, Charles, let's start winding down a little bit. I've got a few questions left. Uh, what is the best advice you've ever received? You know, I, I actually had to tell you that I couldn't think of any. You've never received any good advice. I know. It, I should have made it up and given you a better answer, but I real estate. I, I could not think of like great advice that I had gotten. What I wish someone had told me is to relax a little bit, not think that I was as smart as I was, and be okay. a little more methodical and business-like. But I. The problem is I didn't have that, and that's what got right. me into a lot of trouble. So I'd like to pass that along. Um, you know, maybe you are a whooper snapper, and maybe you're going to be the, the one person with a, with a great new idea that's going to change the world, but I wasn't, and most of us aren't. So that's the advice I wish I had gotten, but I didn't get it. Fair enough. Well, one of my questions was, if you were to look back, what advice would you give yourself so that you're not as smart as you think you are? Is, is that safe to say? It is very safe to say. Yeah, I would say, you know, be organized, be meticulous, be methodical, reach out to people like you and Pine Financial and other industry leaders and learn from people and be respectful and, uh, you know, dip your toe in. And dipping your toe in is good and, and, and take a risk, but make it a measured risk. This is a business. Don't, um, you know, the antithesis to this is the, is the two in the morning, you know, show where people are walking around pools or something. I don't know. That's what I hear. I don't have cable, but I hear about it. got it's me like, into it. That's, seriously? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, that's how I got started. <laughs> Point counterpoint. Okay, I didn't know that. <laughs> wow, I just blushed. Okay, well, apparently anybody can do it then, right? <laughs> you know, I, I just, I think being businesslike and it, you don't have to be super smart. Just don't be stupid. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, can you share one personal habit that you believe has contributed to your success? I think being organized, um, really being organized. And, and I was thinking about this, and I, you, you hear a lot of people say, well, I'm bad with paperwork, and I'm really disorganized, and this and that. I don't know. I, I think that's crazy. <laughs> I think being organized and being methodical and being intelligent is a really, really important thing. And it's it sounds so mundane. You know, I, I'm sure your listeners are looking for a better piece of advice. I wish I had one, but that's the sort of thing that I think is really important is to be business-like and to take it one step at a time. That's my advice. Okay. Uh, well, maybe along those lines, do you have an internet resource uh, like Evernote or something like that that uh, you love and would want to share with our listeners? Maybe something that helps you keep, stay organized? No, I, I, I don't. I mean, not that I don't want to share. I don't. I mean, I am pretty darn low tech. I use Microsoft Outlook. I think it's like the 18th century version of Microsoft Outlook. Okay. Um, you know, I have a, a Samsung S5, you know. I don't need an S6, and I don't need an S7. And let me tell you something, an S7 is not going to make you a better real estate investor. So I, I'm not afraid of technology. I'm fine with it, but at least for me, um, investing in real estate isn't about technology. It's about being organized, meticulous, thoughtful, um, being out among your peers, working really hard. It's it's business, and it's not about technology. So I'm going to punt that one. But I don't. Know, what do you? I'm, I'm going back to you. What's your favorite technology? What what whiz bang thing do you use? I, you know, honestly, I don't. I also ah. use Outlook. I use one of the more recent, <laughs> uh, more recent. I think it's 2013 Outlook. Um, I've got a CRM that I use to just stay on top of you know who my clients are. Uh, Outlook has one, but I don't use that one. I use something with a little bit more functionality, but nothing okay. crazy. I use something free. I don't pay for the CRM. Um, I I do use Evernote, although I think it's way more powerful than what I have any idea about. Uh, I just put notes in there, and then I usually forget that I made a note. Uh, but it's there somewhere. 
Um, Dropbox I use for keeping a lot of uh, my files, uh, organizing my rentals, uh, and then Excel spreadsheets. I have a ton of Excel spreadsheets, yeah, uh, too. probably too many, but it's a, Excel spreadsheets are an easier way for me to just organize and keep things and move things and change things. And yeah, that's that's really about it. Yeah, I think I would just basically agree with you. It's it's not about technology. It's about doing things like this. Yeah, absolutely. And for me, nothing beats uh, pen and paper. You know, I love to write things down, pencil things out. I mean, as it is right here, just for these questions, and I've got probably seven, eight pieces of paper that I'm jotting notes on that I have the questions on. Uh, I love having just the tangible uh, aspect of paper in my hand. Um, well. Speaking of paper in your hand, if you could recommend one book, and you may have already done that, what would it be? Yeah, it, it, it's not really an investing book. At the Millionaire Real Estate, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, the what was it? The um, Millionaire uh, Next Door. Millionaire Next Door. Sorry about that. I only quoted <laughs> Gary Keller's book, which was a great. Book, it is a but, great uh, book. Yeah, uh, yeah, the Millionaire Next Door. I just thought it was so interesting. Um, Boy, people just aren't the people you think the people are, <laughs> and you, yeah. you should treat everybody respectful because it, it might be the last person you think um, is the person you really want to get to know. And just the the data they did was just fascinating. You know, it was. I, I remember this was 20 years ago, or whatever. But I remember like doctors are the worst managers of money. Why? Because they think they're the smartest people out there, and they are not so good with money. Um, just very, very insightful. And also Moneyball, I thought, was, was terrific. Just a fun, fun read, a great book. And just, uh, it, it's instructive to, to potentially think a little bit different and outside the box. And it was just, it was well written and just um, really a pleasure. So maybe those two books. But they're not real estate books, honestly. Um, I, I read all the real estate books, and I got to tell you, I kind of personally didn't get anything out of them. And that's probably a function of me. And maybe you can, and maybe you did, but I didn't. I learned everything on the street and working with people like you. And I don't know if that's good or bad, but it's the truth. Yeah, I mean, everybody has a different path. You know, uh, you kind of dove right in and started buying properties uh, at a younger age, a little earlier than some. Uh, so you've had more time uh, to learn, you know, trial by fire in your deals, where somebody else may be starting off a little later in life, or you know, is uh, doesn't have as much time to go in and do those things and they want to pick up some books and learn some things or at least uh, you know, not learn as they lose money or, or have uh, riskier deals. Uh, so they learn through somebody else, uh, and potentially somebody who wrote a book. So yeah, but I, I like the, way you, the spin you put on those books uh, where it's not just a good fun read, Moneyball necessarily, but it, it helps you think uh, somebody else thought a little differently. What can I maybe think about a little differently that can help my business? So I think that's a, a great recommendation on a couple levels. Uh, so that was, uh, we're almost done here, but we got some people listening who are asking questions. And Charles, I'm actually really excited to ask you this one. Uh, Tim asks uh, about legal entities to protect yourself from rental property issues. Tell us so, how you protect yourself, okay, Charles. Don't, don't, don't laugh at me, Justin, because you know the answer. So I've owned rental properties for 19 years, and um, I still have them in my personal name. So if you're looking to see this, no, don't, don't, don't sue me. I met with Stephanie, Justin, on Friday, who is a colleague of ours who's been a wonderful attorney, and I finally met with an attorney and said, hey, you know, can we talk about a little asset protection here? And I'm on the path to doing some asset protection. But the fact is, um, I, I, at this moment, still have all of my properties in my personal name. So I, I don't think you should do what I did. I'm not recommending that. But I also think that spending three years uh, creating trusts in Utah before you bought anything is like probably a waste of three years because um, you actually need to get into real estate before you have any uh, assets to protect in real estate. So um, as it happens, finally I'm getting around to doing what I think is the right thing. I do have a, a very good um, uh, what call umbrella policy, and that was a good thing that I've done. But I, I, and a lot of folks just like me, you know, we kind of just don't get around to doing the asset protection that we probably should do. And I, I finally did it just a few days ago. Interesting. Well, would you mind taking a second and just sharing maybe what you and Stephanie had discussed, uh, what or what you're planning on uh, putting yeah. into effect? Because you do well, have so what, there's free lots, and clear property. Yeah, there, yeah, exactly. So I got these free and clear properties. There are enormous um, depths you can get into. And what I said, what I instructed her is, hey, let me uh, 
dip my toe in the water here. What's, you know, what's the easiest thing to start? What we're going to do is we're going to create a master LLC. So I need to uh, have a checking account uh, with that master LLC. And then we'll create little sub LLCs. And each property will be a sub LLC underneath and managed by the master LLC. Um, in the state of Colorado, my understanding is it's better to have two people on the LLC than one. So my wife and I will be on the LLCs, and this will give us a reasonable level of protection that for the past 19 years I haven't had. Oh, by the way, I've never been sued in 19 years. You know, and I'm probably more lucky than good, but maybe a little good. Never been sued. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I think. Uh, uh, it's interesting. I actually had a meeting with Stephanie as well Friday morning. Uh, we were talking more taxes than asset protection and stuff. But uh, yeah, we had. Uh, she said you were coming in in the afternoon, and I kind of chuckled knowing that you had zero asset protection. So I was really interested in how that was going to go. Yeah, um, it's the right thing. It's absolutely the right thing. It's not going to be expensive. It's going to give me a level of protection that is way beyond what I have now. Beyond that, boy, there are incredible things you can do if you've got some serious assets. You might want to dig deeper into it. Absolutely, and even what you're doing uh, by having the master LLC and then the sub LLCs is still a slightly more advanced asset protection strategy. But it's because you have the 19 years of experience; you already have, you know, more than a handful of properties. So it's something that makes sense for you to dive into. Uh, yeah. But I think what you you said makes a lot of sense. Uh, it's what I usually recommend to people when I first talk to them. You know, the newer folks, uh, and they're talking about getting these LLCs or setting up this uh, this onion of asset protection, if you will. Um, just buy a property, do your first flip, do your first rental, see if you even like it. You know, did you make money? Did you love the process? Uh, I lost money on my, but I fell in love with the process. Uh, and so I'm still here today uh, and I've learned from it and I bought that first property in my personal name. Um, so once you know that yes, this really is for you, then you can start digging into some of those other things that take more time and, and add more cost to your business. Uh, and having an umbrella policy, uh, having good insurance, is probably one of the best asset protection things you can do that most people don't think of right away. They think yeah, of I actually corporations, asked, LLCs. I asked Stephanie about the umbrella because I said I've never heard of an investor uh, actually invoke the umbrella policy and she said no no I, they do in her business because she's a busy attorney helping out people like us she said no no she sees it she sees the umbrella payoffs and that was yeah. really good for me to know because I've never heard of anybody having because generally what happens is you are protected up to about 300,000 on your basis insurance policy and then the umbrella kicks in above say three or five hundred thousand up to a million or two million uh, and I've never in 19 years of knowing everybody in town ever heard of anybody actually getting hit but she says yep it happens and they cover you so go and get an umbrella policy and they're not yeah. expensive three four hundred bucks a year exactly it's cheap it's easy and it's that extra level of protection because you know everybody wants to sue for a million dollars uh, and you know you're the owner of the property they want to sue you come after you personally but the easier thing is to say I've got insurance the insurance is a million dollars. Sue me for a million dollars. Insurance will cover it, and then you and your properties and you know everything else should hopefully stay relatively safe. They're probably not going to go after you for more than the easy insurance policy. Let me ask you. Hopefully, do you know I'm any investors? An no, you're not, and neither am I. But we know lots of people. My question is, do you know any investors who've ever um, been sued enough that their umbrella policy kicked in? No, I don't know anybody. You know, that we know a too. lot of people. It just doesn't happen very often. Mm -hmm. Get CPA advice. Get attorney's advice. Don't listen to schmucks like us. Get real <laughs> advice. But between the two of us, we know lots of people. It just doesn't happen very often. It's important to know. Yeah, absolutely. And and Stephanie that we keep referring to is Stephanie Long with, uh, they just changed their name, Long Law Group. Uh, and if you're interested in, in reaching out to Stephanie, she works nationwide. She has clients all across the country, not just here in Colorado. Uh, you can find her info on pinefinancialgroup.com under uh, resources, I believe. Um, you can find out all her contact info. She'd be more than happy to, uh, to talk to you. She deals with, uh, she's very real estate investor focused, they do tax and real estate law, so uh, it can be a great resource. Um, Charles, one last question uh, about VIP 
uh, Matt Pilmore. So we, we know uh, Matt, Matt Pilmore, VIP, financial education, uh, talks about uh, buying and paying off properties. And the question, because you have free and clear properties, have you used Matt's program or, or did you do something similar to that or how did you maybe pay off your properties? Yeah, so, so Matt's one of my best buddies. He actually just called a few minutes ago. He's out in California right now. Um, so Matt and I, uh, we got to know each other about eight years ago. We were, did a radio show. They, they were working on all of this stuff. I have never actually used it because you're asking, so I'll tell you, I actually wasn't a great candidate for it because I had no debt. Uh, even when I did actually have debt, um, I could have used it, but it, I wasn't, it's the, it's the person who has the more debt is, he can do more for those types of people. So I never did. Lots of my clients have used it. And I'll tell you, um, it was years ago, I, I was so fascinated by this protocol, by this way of paying off debt. I stayed up all night one time trying to understand it and get it through my thick head, and I finally got it. The whole paycheck parking, in a million years, I couldn't have come up with something like that. It is so, so interesting, and it actually works. I can guarantee you, if you look at this and you do what it says to do, it will work. And it's public information, most of it, a lot of it, how to do it. The problem is no one will do it. It's yep. the perfect example of the exercise equipment, the 10,000 bucks of equipment in your basement. It's great if you do it. If you don't do it, it's a waste of money. I would say the exact same thing for what Matt does. Um, working with them and actually following their advice, it is mathematics. They can show you if you do X, the result will be Y, and it's an incredible way to build wealth and pay off debt. Yeah, absolutely, and I think a lot of the benefit from working with Matt and his group is the accountability of it. You know, the great example you just gave of the gym equipment in your house—that's great, but if you don't use it, it's not worth anything. So, if you hire a personal trainer, somebody to come and hold you accountable and show you how to use that equipment, you're going to reap the benefits. Same thing with what Matt and uh, and his group do. Uh, and speaking of, I don't think we've had Matt on the webinar yet. If you're interested, uh, I believe we have him also in that referral section on PineFinancialGroup.com. Check him out if you want to see something sooner, but we'll probably have him on the webinar here coming up soon so you can uh, expose all the math and numbers that Charles was just uh, referring to. Uh, well, Charles, I, I've truly enjoyed listening to your journey. Uh, the stories you shared uh, were somewhat inspiring. Just kidding. Uh, <laughs> so give us one parting piece of advice. Uh, share the best way we can get a, uh, get a hold of you, and then sure. we'll say goodbye. Uh... You know, just work with really good people like Pine Financial, for example. You know, I think I've said it before, but methodical and business-like, by and large, those are the people that I see actually building great wealth in real estate. And more often than not, it's the people who say, I need to buy at 20 cents on the dollar and I need to do this creative thing and things like that. I'm not saying it never works. Of course it does. But when you get to see 500 plus agents and thousands of investors, you start to sift through and realize who's making the money and who isn't. And it's the it's more of the kind of the boring person and the you know, and the old car who just is nice and helpful and will help other people. And that's really what I recommend, you know, is, is, is get to know people like Pine Financial and our lenders and other people that we know in our market and in your market. Do the same thing in your market. Reach out. People will help you. Uh, it, it worked for me. It worked for you, uh, Justin. You know, that's, that's what we do. Yeah, and uh, to reach me, um, you know, just give me a call. I guess uh, my cell phone, 303-523-3837. Um, and even if you're out of town, I, I talk to people. I have a, a YouTube site, Building Wealth with Real Estate. You can go and check that out. And people call me all the time just to talk about stuff. I love talking about this stuff. And my email is uh, C Roberts, the letter C, R-O-B-E-R-T-S, at your castle, Y-O-U-R, castle dot O-R-G. Love to help out if I can. Fantastic. Well, thank you. And I can't believe you actually just gave out your cell phone number. But uh, <laughs> thank you so much, Charles. Uh, thank you for being so generous with your time, your expertise, and your experience. Really appreciate you having me here. Uh, mm -hmm. And have a great night. We'll see you soon. It was a pleasure. Thanks, Justin.